but Pakistan was regularly uh, violating the ceasefire. Around 2008-2009, if you'd uh, seen the TV screen uh, on the scroll below, by and large every second day you had this going that uh, Pakistan violates ceasefire. So most of those cases were uh, in my battalion area. What you're hoping for in Kashmir is to encounter. Basically, you're looking for them. My father uh, had uh, hopes from me of uh, doing doing IIT or, you know, the the common stereotype fields. I was always interested in commanding men and not machines, and hence my choice for the army and the infantry. Welcome back to another episode of Flipping Founders. My name is Kushi Sethi and I'm really excited for you all to see the next episode. I hope you find it helpful. Enjoy the show. Today I'm excited to introduce the retired Colonel Manish Sareen to the podcast. He joined the Indian Army in 1991 and has extensive operational experience in challenging environments like Nagaland, Siachen, Kashmir Valley, line of control at Pooch. He has also been an instructor at the infantry school in Madhya Pradesh that is the oldest and the largest uh, training center for the Indian Army. He has played an important role in shaping future military leaders. He currently serves as a military consultant for defense procurement and lends his expertise to the Hindi film industry including notable contributions to films like Sam Bahadur and other TV shows. His journey has been nothing less than a Bollywood movie itself. Thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to Flipping Founders. Getting straight to the first question, what inspired you to join the army and how did your journey unfold from that? Uh, there was no single incident of inspiration as such. Uh, when I was in school, uh, I was good in academics and of course my father uh, had uh, hopes from me of uh, doing, doing IIT or you know the, the common stereotype fields that uh, were prevalent at that time. There were very limited options at that time. Uh, but somehow I was not very keen on it and uh, the uniform always had some allure for me. And in the uniforms I was always interested in commanding men and not machines and hence my choice for the army and the infantry. So it was a bit of a, a rebellion at home when I decided and announced that uh, I'm going to be joining the army. Uh, since then, I was very lucky that I got commissioned in a very, very good battalion. I was commissioned into the 2nd Battalion, the 8th Gorkha Rifles. We call it 28 GR. And uh, it's a battalion that I consider to be one of the best in the Indian Army. And I think uh, my formative years in the Army were all thanks to my battalion. The kind of grooming that they uh, provided me, the kind of values that they instilled in uh, me. Uh, Everything that I did in the army sort of started from there. I was also very fortunate to command uh, the Gorkhas. That was in, indeed a, a unique experience uh, in itself. They are very, very capable soldiers and I had the proud privilege of commanding them. Oh, that sounds excellent. And which wars have you been a part of and how have they shaped your perspective on leadership and service? Which wars, you say? Yeah, which wars or operations? Uh, no, uh, wars-wise, since uh, 71, we haven't had a, a major war. Kargil, of course, was uh, a limited war. But uh, India and the Indian Army has been extensively involved in operations uh, ever since, you know. And I had the, uh, uh, the good fortune to take part in operations both in uh, the Northeast and uh, in uh, JNK. Um, it is, uh, th there is uh, an ex-commanding officer of mine, Kanharsh Tiwari, who once said that, uh, he said this about my battalion, and I think it applies to uh, the entire Indian Army. He says, easy to lead and difficult to command. 
is it indeed because the indian soldier i think is the best soldier in the world you just have to see the kind of conditions they serve in and for a protracted period of time for his entire service every second or third year he is going back into operations and he is staying there for 2 to 3 years in conditions that i mean you just have to see the kind of accommodation we provide him and yet without a frown on his face he smilingly serves every day is difficult but he does it so willingly that's why it's so easy to lead them it's it's really uh, uh, really a privilege i don't think any other soldier in any other country goes through the kind of difficult situations that the indian army soldier does and yet he does it so smilingly um when you are in operations uh you are the person that all the soldiers are looking up to so the first thing that uh, really is the most important is is professional competence they expect you to lead they expect you to form a good plan and they expect you to properly execute it and finally they expect you to be able to adapt or make changes because nothing goes according to them right. the moment the first bullet is fired uh, most plans go all right so that is their expectation from you and that's where uh, the leader comes in one of the reasons why you'll find that the uh, indian army has so many casualties in young officers is because invariably they're leading from the front which is not the case in all armies right so uh, once uh, the first shot is fired you'll find that the immediate reaction of course is to go to ground and and then you uh, sort of uh, reconcile and then uh, you react and uh, this is where the officer comes he's the first one who needs to get up and get everybody moving and then coordinate everything there so in terms of experience in operations uh, lucky to have such troops to command lucky, lucky to have Uh, the kind of officers that are served with uh, in terms of experience all operations are different i mean you could have gone into one had some kind of an experience and you can be rest assured that when you go back into another operation in a similar situation or even the same situation things will pan out totally differently because you are pitted against somebody who you don't know how uh, he is going to react uh again this is where you need to be uh, flexible and if if you've trained well on the basics then of course it's easy to adapt yeah and also just talking about the siachen conflict like i remember i was in school and i studied about that and i think you're fighting over like 20000 feet and you also had to take care of your troops so can you please tell me a bit about the siachen conflict uh, the siachen is uh the highest battlefield in the world and the battle there is not as much against the enemy as it is against the elements yeah. so you have of course uh, the the altitude and the weather and uh, at that time of course there was a ceasefire even now there is but uh, there were still super sporadic in, uh, incidents of uh, firing uh the tenure there was limited you were not Uh, spending more than three months. Anybody uh, who went up there did three months and then came back because uh, even three months is quite a lot in that kind of terrain. And I think some studies show that there is actually some permanent effect on your body in terms of memory loss, etc. There's people who who face and and how much is the temperature over there? It goes down to minus forty, minus fifty. So minus forty, minus fifty. If I remember correctly, yeah. and you're out there for like hours as long as the you're there for three months. You're you're staying there. Of course, you. Uh, it's not that you are always in the open uh, but even then it's very very challenging and then um you know commanding your troops in such a difficult environment um where it's almost like the weather is against you and i also read that on both sides on the indian and pakistan side a lot of the casualties have just been due to the weather most casualties are uh, due to the weather uh one thing that uh, happens there is that uh, sometimes you cannot evacuate if the weather is packed the evacuation is uh, by helicopter and if the weather is packed and it can be packed for days so you can't evacuate so even if it's a small toothache it can turn out to be very very dire 
So before you are actually inducted, there is actually a dental uh, examination and uh, sometimes uh, you find that there is a tooth that can give a problem and simply removed because you can't take the chance of going there and then being stuck there for 10 to 12 days right. for the weather to open up with a bad toothache. So evacuation is very, very, uh, it's, it's dicey. If the weather is bad then and uh, of course the Indian Air Force and the Indian Army Aviation who are uh, flying the helicopters there, uh, hats off to them. They take a lot of chances. I mean, everybody would say that this is not very safe to uh, fly in this weather, but they still do because to them to save that one life is very, very important. Yeah. And they're willing to risk their own life to do that. So um, the, uh, the challenge is, is the weather, the elements. Enemy is secondary. Right. And then the, how did you um, just keep your troops safe and motivated while also fulfilling like the objectives of the operation? Uh, firstly, motivation. Uh, I've said this earlier, the Indian Army soldier is, Does not need motivation. is motivated. I mean, he, he needs very little. Uh, the organization as such is geared up to provide him the logistic support. Mm -hmm. They'll give him uh, extra rations, special rations, there's, uh, 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 there's the special clothing. So whatever is required is, is provided. Uh, so motivation wise, uh, all Indian Army officers that way are, uh, I think, very lucky. Born to, no, not only that, they're born to, uh, to be concerned about their troops. And, and it shows, I mean, uh, the Indian soldier knows how an officer is, um, uh, no, his concern for uh, the soldier. So motivation is not, uh, but yes, you have to be careful uh, about, uh, about simple things like uh, you establish drills for nearly everything. So even if you're just uh, moving from point A to point B, there is a drill of, you know, being roped in together. So that in case there's a crevice, you are able to, you, it's not that uh, you lose a single person. So there's, uh, there are defined things for uh, everything which uh, the officer and uh, all commanders down the chain sh uh, do rigorously enforce. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, it costs lives. Right. And can you tell me um, a bit about your time in Kashmir? You also served in the Kashmir Valley and line of control at Pooch. What was that like? Uh, when I was in uh, uh, in Kashmir, and how old were you? Uh, yeah, so I was just coming to that because uh, it was I was uh, much younger. I was, uh, I mean, various stages. Uh, I was you know, 31, 32. So as a young company commander, uh, uh, you, you're looking for operations. You, it's something that uh, looking for adventure. That, that I won't call it adventure. It's something that you've trained for. Yeah. It's, it's sort of professional fulfillment. So you are actually uh, doing so much of training right from the time you join the NDA and then IMA and then uh, in your battalion, even in peacetime you keep training for those few uh, days where you actually get to encounter the enemy or terrorists. So uh, any operation is to that extent professionally fulfilling. Uh, what you're hoping for in Kashmir is to encounter. Basically, you're looking for them, right? Uh, so you will be- And you're looking for who? For terrorists. So you're going out maybe 20, 30, 40 times and out of that, maybe once you will have an encounter and uh, you are, you're hoping to make that count, right? Because every time you go out, for instance, on an ambush or for a search and raid, you are, you're not uh, always going to uh, succeed in encountering them. But when you make contact, then you want to make it count. Right. So you are still, you're, you're always looking for that opportunity and that's why you have your intelligence sources, you try and uh, keep in touch with the police, you have uh, some information coming from uh, higher headquarters. All this is designed so that you can find out where he is to locate him and then hope to contact him and then eliminate him. Mm -hmm. uh, the line of control is slightly different in the sense that uh, there are the, the parameters are a bit more defined. Uh, there is a fence. There is uh, uh, at least at that time there was a ceasefire. It still is now, uh, but Pakistan was regularly uh, violating the ceasefire, and they have this uh, disposable uh, resource of the LET or the JM 
that they say is not the Pakistani army, but they are obviously sponsored and trained and facilitated by the Pakistan army. Uh, on our side, uh, we are more stringent about the uh, ceasefire that you know, there are some stipulations in place, we must uh, try and adhere to them. Uh, so the, uh, the operation there is a bit, a little bit more constrained. Uh, in my case, uh, the line of control was where I commanded my battalion and it was in, uh, amongst other places, one of the most active places. This was at uh, uh, near Punch. And uh, around 2008, 2009, if you would uh, seen the TV screen uh, on the scroll below, by and large, every second day you had this going that uh, Pakistan violates ceasefire. So most of those cases were uh, in my battalion area. And uh, very interesting times, uh, very, very uh, active, very challenging, of course, very satisfying. Right. And um, I do know that after 370, there have been changes in Kashmir. But when you were serving, what challenges did you and your troops face at that time with whatever government that was in charge, the different times you've served? Well, 370 was still there uh, when, I, uh, when I was in the army. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of impact it's made after on ground, so I won't comment on that. Uh, but I think as far as the soldier on the ground is concerned and uh, at, at the working level, mm. not much different them. They would still be of, they would still be seeking terrorists and, and, uh, and eliminating them. Mm -hmm. 370 or no 370. Right. And do you think that um, India can get back be okay? I don't think I'm competent to comment on that. Uh, if a war breaks out between yeah, so it's been 75, uh, 76 years since mm -hmm. we got independent and speaker. So in the context of history, 75 years is nothing. Right. I mean, you look at uh, there are errors, 400, 500, uh, yeah. thousand years. So uh, for all you know, 25 years from now, things will be very different. But what I can say is that. Uh, the India-Pakistan dynamic, to my mm. limited knowledge, because this is not exactly my field, uh, has changed dramatically. Positively, negatively. Uh, in India's favor, I mean, because I think I think we just left them far behind. I mean, it's it's not even a, you know the hyphenated relationship we had earlier. Mm. I don't think that's really relevant anymore. Mm. I mean, they're nowhere close to us in all aspects. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it be militarily, whether it be uh, uh, economically, yeah. uh, in terms of human indices, anything. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not POK comes back to us, I don't know. I mean, this is something that the future will tell. Yeah, no, that, that would be interesting because I do know that after 2020, a lot of kind of, um, let's say, wars have broken out between neighbors. And a lot of, like, if you see, like Russia, Ukraine, then you have Israel, Palestine. Yeah. And now there's been like a lot of talk also about like India, Pakistan, but I guess we'll see what happens. And now transitioning into Legion. I don't see why there should be a, a war there. They're, they're self-destructing anyway. So they're, they're imploding. We don't really to, I mean, maybe give them a nudge, but <laughs> they're helping themselves. So. And um, transitioning into leadership, what qualities do you believe are essential for effective leadership in the army? I, uh, I mean, if I uh, uh, would speak to my younger officers who were assuming command, I would say there are two things that are important for a commanding officer. And uh, that is to have broad shoulders and a big heart. Uh, broad shoulders because you need to take a lot of responsibility. Uh, at, the level, at the unit level, at the battalion level, the responsibility, the, the buck stops from the top as well as from the bottom. Mm -hmm. So. Anybody in a, uh, in a unit is looking up to what the CEO is saying and his word is law. Right. So if he says that the sun rises from the west, then the sun rises from the west. Uh, from the top, they are expecting that everything that the army wants to do is executed at that level. So that's why broad shoulders because everything is uh, coming out to him. I think the most important appointment uh, in the army is the commanding officer of uh, a battalion. And secondly, a big heart because uh, you need to have, you're looking after so many men. Each one of them has uh, their issues. And 
you cannot be mollycoddling them, you cannot uh, be soft, but at the same time, you do need to care for them. Also, uh, you're in the kind of profession where uh, a reversal is can be very, very tragic. So, whereas in other places, you might lose money, you might lose business, here you lose, life. uh, you lose lives. And uh, you cannot let that affect you in terms of going for what goes, uh, what uh, what lies ahead, mm -hmm. you have to sort of reconcile to that and, and and start moving ahead. So for that, you need to have a really big heart and say, okay, fine, this has happened, but I need to I need to get back and I need to get my men motivated again. Yeah, and then during you know your twenty years in the army, what were some of um, could you provide some insight into? the effect, like most effective like strategies or tactics that you've witnessed or maybe you've used during your service? Uh, by and large, I mean, when you are, uh, the army trains you for different kind of situations. So uh, you have different levels of courses and there are some, uh, some basics uh, spelled out. So I'm not going to go into the details of that, but uh, I would say that the elemental things, uh, good firing, physical fitness, uh, minor tactics at uh, the lowest level. If you got these things correct, the other things uh, do not take much time to adapt to. So mm -hmm. if I have my uh, command trained well in the basics, then any kind of operational role I get, whether it be in the mountains or be it be in the deserts, plains, counterterrorism mm -hmm. operations, anywhere, if these basics are correct, then it doesn't take much time to adapt and we should be able to. In terms of, uh, I, I, mean, I won't, strategy was not really my level, but operationally, uh, one of the things that uh, I learned very early on is that uh, the, the security of my post or posts, depending on which appointment I was in, was not from inside. It had to be aggressive, it had to be outside. So it's not that I can uh, deploy everything inside a uh, sort of contained area and then wait for anybody to come. If I want my post to be secure, then I need somebody outside so that actually he can be dealt with much before he even reaches my post. Right, no, that, that's very interesting. And then now you um, work as a military consultant for um, defense procurement. And what is that industry like? Could you give some insights into that role and also just the defense industry? So when I retired from the army, I was, uh, I was very young. I was 41 when I took premature retirement. Uh, and then I worked with uh, an Israeli company uh, for a good about 10 years before I became a military consultant. I'm still consulting with the same uh, company. Uh, from being in the army to outside and still being connected, you tend to get a different perspective on things. I mean, uh, all my experience was at the unit level and not beyond that. Uh, but here you're dealing with, uh, with the army headquarters because major procurement is from the army headquarters. Uh, it's been now about, what, 12 years since I retired. And when I uh, joined uh, Rafael, at that time, there was still a lot of focus on procurement from outside India. Mm -hmm. So uh, foreign companies like Rafael, of course, were doing a lot of business. They had a lot to offer. And within these 10 to 12 years, the dynamics have changed a bit. There is now more and more focus on procuring from Indian companies by uh, whatever means and to, to sort of empower uh, both the large companies as well as MSMEs to be able to produce in India. So you'll find that uh, even uh, now, even foreign companies uh, are very rarely dealing directly uh, towards procurement. They are involving Indian partners. Right. So uh, most companies will look at either joint ventures or some kind of uh, MOUs or arrangements mm -hmm. and work with Indian uh, partners so that uh, a lot can be manufactured in India. Uh, uh, it's still, uh, still fledgling, but I think that this approach over a period of time would materialize in more manufacturing in India, which is good. I mean, the yeah. stated goal is Atman Nirbhar Bharat. Uh, of course, uh, nothing is perfect. I mean, when you when you say that we'll stop all import and we'll manufacture, it's not a decision you take overnight. Mm -hmm. 
it takes some time for even in Indian industry. So, uh, so no decision is perfect. There will be some uh, obstacles as you uh, as you proceed. But hopefully, the eventual goal of being self-reliant will be achieved. If not in the near or uh, mid term, at least in the long term. No, I think the the government's doing a great job making sure that it happens sooner rather than later. And not just talking about warfare and then you're in defense procurement. As and when technologies, if as and when there are more technologies, they have pros and they have cons. And one of the cons can also be that they're going to be used for like warfare. And it may be like good for the country and not good for the enemies. But we've seen again, Siachen was mountain warfare. We've also seen biological warfare. What are some of the other warfares that you think would come up in the future? So uh, I, I would put uh, mountain warfare in a different context. That's more as the kind of terrain you're operating in. But in terms of uh, technology, what is happening more and more is, uh, is remote operation. So you'll find that uh, uh, the skies are now being ruled by drones. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the uh, recent uh, Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan, war was an example that was won by uh, Azerbaijan mainly because of their strength in uh, uh, we call them UAVs mm -hmm. unmanned aerial vehicles India recently is uh, in the process of you know procuring yes, uh, from the from the US, US. so uh, uh, we know that the Americans in Afghanistan have been using UAVs for a long time and not wanting to risk uh, lives on ground so this is now becoming uh, sort of the trend. You'll find that instead of manned turrets, you have remote controlled weapon stations, you have remote uh, ground vehicles. And um, now just talking about something that I haven't seen um, a lot of discussion about in the Indian media. So when soldiers are obviously you know, away from family and they have to protect their nation, they have to protect their troops, it can be very emotionally challenging for them as well. Um, no matter how much they train. So how did you cope with the emotional toll of being separated from your family and also just, you know, being in such dangerous situations, protecting yourself, protecting your nation, protecting your troops? Well, just uh, to answer the second part first, when you are, you're not looking at yourself actually uh, being in a dangerous position. It's, it's just something that becomes part of your life. You know, that you're going there for operations and you're not, you're not going there uh, with sort of the mindset that you're going into a dangerous sector. It's, it's something that it is part of your of life. The family issue is, is very, very important. And I think uh, uh, soldiers across the country, across the world actually are celebrated for their sacrifice. But the biggest sacrifice is made by the families. family. So the responsibility of the wife is not just to her own family. Uh, it is also to the families of the soldiers you're commanding. Uh, we have a very, very good culture in the army where uh, the unit is like a family. It's a family, uh, like uh, I said, I was commissioned in a 2-8 GR mm -hmm. and uh, I would serve with 2-8 GR. I would go out on some assignments for two years, then come back to the battalion. So that remained my home for close to 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and st it still is my family. Uh, if there is today a requirement for me uh, to ask somebody for something, I may once hesitate to ask my own brother, but I would never hesitate to ask a battalion officer. But coming back to the ladies, so when the unit is in field or, or, or in war, so the families stay behind and, and they rally together. And this is, this is sort of led by the officer's wife and mainly the, the commanding officer's wife. So it's not just his family. Mm -hmm. that uh, the, uh, not just her family that the uh, lady is uh, looking for, uh, looking, uh, looking after, it's also the entire battalion, I mean making sure uh, and she cannot afford to be seen as weak, I mean even if yeah. uh, you would have seen some interviews, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I saw somewhere, uh, there was a false report or a similar name uh, officer who, who, uh, who was uh, killed in action. Uh, but that lady could not show her grief or you know her fear or uh, so they have a very very challenging role and uh, really much much more than the person in the front uh, is going through 
No, that's that's very true. And I and I love just how like connected everyone is, not just like like all your like troops and their their families together. It's it's really beautiful. And how are the psychological and emotional, let's say, challenges that are faced by soldiers addressed post retirement? Because once you're in a war zone and you're seeing death, then you're seeing death of like let's say like your troops and they're they're like your brothers and then next year in like civilian life and worldwide soldiers do suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder not all but a lot of them so how are they adjust i i ptsd i mean to my mind is is a very western concept i mean at least i have not yet met anybody who's uh, had that kind of trauma post retirement i mean uh, and i'm sure that the indian soldier uh, at an average would have seen much more action than most other armies in the world mm-hmm. but uh, i've seen so many people who've seen uh, a lot of operations all kinds of operations mm-hmm. but i i don't see any uh, ptsd i mean there may be one odd very isolated case but uh, really not here uh, life after retirement uh, that is uh, that is difficult at least to start with Uh, uh different for men and uh, different for officers and and for the men uh, so if you take an officer uh, at an average an officer is retiring at the age of 54 mm-hmm. uh, a colonel would retire at the age and uh, about 60 percent would retire at, uh, at at the rank of colonel 54 is too young to retire right uh, I, i'm i'm going to be 54 uh, now uh, very soon and uh, i couldn't imagine myself leading a retired life but after you've retired at the age of 54 it's also very difficult to start a fresh in a new career you may get a job somewhere but to to make a new career right uh, you also uh, generally infantry officers or uh, unless you're technical qualified you don't have the qualifications to to work in the then apart from that you are now transitioning from a very very uh, organized life you know every every part of a life while you're in the army is is defined I mean, uh, everything is known this is what this is what you've been doing for the last 30 34 years uh, and then suddenly there's a void right. uh, that's left behind and you're sitting at home and uh, you don't know what to do Uh, of course everybody tries to look for something to do you might start something of your own or you might uh, pick up a job but yes it is difficult and uh, it's not that jobs are uh, so forthcoming for the men it may be even more difficult because uh, they are retiring even younger mm-hmm. so somebody who's retiring let's say at the age of 37 38 40 uh, and without any qualifications Uh, it's not that jobs are easy to come by right, right? Uh, so even though they have their pension but it's still not uh, not enough but more than the money it is what you're doing with your time and are you doing something constructive uh, some do but uh, yes uh, most people do have uh, they would prefer not to retire let me say <laughs> so. right and was there any moment where um you know during like your time where a decision or a certain experience just left you very emotional and you just have to be like no like and and it could be you know pride or it could be grief um uh, well there are there are a lot of defining moments but there's one incident that uh, uh, i always like to mention because it sort of signifies uh, the determination the resolve the strength of the indian soldier and this is uh, this is a havaldar who was Uh, in my unit this is Havaldar Rajkumar Shrest uh so as i told you uh, when we were uh, at the line of control we used to have a lot of these cease fire violations and i also mentioned i'd like to send people out so i decided i need to send ambushes and patrols uh, out uh, the problem was that uh, uh, since there have been so many wars most of the areas ahead of the fence were mined and in the mountains the mines drift so even if you have a record of the mines they don't stay i mean you could so it meant that first you had to get the mines cleared so we had uh, people from the engineers coming in and clearing uh, the mines so that we could make uh, lanes through which mm-hmm. patrols and ambushes could go out so once this was done uh, i and i started sending ambushes out 
to Haldar Rajkumar Shrest was uh, the leader of one of uh, these ambushes. And he went out at last light and he would have been in the ambush for the night and he was to return just before first light. So on his way back, Rajkumar Shrest uh, stepped on a mine. And uh, I got the news and uh, I rushed there and uh, along with the RMO, the regimental medical officer. So when I reach uh, there and I meet Rajkumar Shrest, which is just next to the fence where the mines were there. Even though the area was clear, there, it's not 100%, one or two mine may have been left. So this man says, I'm sorry. Now here is a man who's got his foot lying a foot away from him. And he's not worried about the fact that he's lost his foot. He's worried about the fact that he's caused this kind of trouble, that he's probably led let his commanding officer down without even a moment's thought towards his loss. And to me that sort of exemplifies what the Indian soldier is. Uh, I mean, I, I took this one name, but every one of them is like that. Uh, um, there is a PS to that. Uh, Rajkumar Shrest, of course, he got uh, a prosthetic limb and he proceeded to do everything that he was required to do. He rose to become a Subedar Major, that was the highest rank that he could get. Uh, he never let that uh, loss or that incident diminish his, uh, uh, his resolve, his strength. Uh, and continued to do everything that was required without any inhibitions. So I always like to quote this just to mention what stuff the Indian Army soldiers made of. So we're, we're very lucky as civilians that we have soldiers like you and you know everyone up there who just you know are like working day and night to make sure that we can sleep safely and again like just do civilian stuff like interviews and just like spend time with family. And that's so equally important. There's a lot of respect for um, anyone in the defense forces. And who were you when you joined the army? Who was, you know, let's say Mr. Manishrin when he joined the army? And who was he once he left the army? What changes did you see personally once you went in and then once you came back? I always find it difficult to answer these kind of questions because I really don't know who I was. I mean, just a normal kid going to school, having aspirations of, you know, uh, working somewhere, doing well. Uh, got to choose uh, a, a profession of my choice. Luckily, managed to get through because at that time it was not easy to get through uh, ND. I mean, it was, there was huge competition. Uh, and once you are, uh, once you're inside, then everything else is taken care of by the army. I mean, they'll make sure that they make you what uh, what the job requires. So, starting from um, from physical fitness, for instance, I was I was 53 kgs, very very you know normal. And you, how old normal were you once you joined? Uh, I was short of 17 when I joined India. Okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here in Delhi, I was a typical uh, Delhi, uh, Delhi wala. Hmm. And there you are with people who are uh, a lot of oh, them yeah. from from um, from army schools, from Rashtra uh, in Indian Military College, from Sainik schools. Uh, of course, they've had this experience of army experience, so mm -hmm. to say, for a long time. But uh, I mean, yes, it was difficult for me uh, initially. But what oh, took they make you? They make you fit for what you're required to do. That's, that's wonderful. And now talking about Gorkha rifles. For people who don't know, what are Gorkha rifles and what are their responsibilities? The responsibilities are the same. To, uh, I mean, they, they're like any other uh, soldier. Uh, so a bit of a historical background here. The, uh, the British first recruited uh, the Gorkhas. And uh, that's because they were very, very impressed with their bravery and with their martial skills. So there were 10 regiments of uh, Gorkhas that were raised, starting from 1 to 10, uh, of which uh, uh, 2, 6, 7 and 10 Gorkhas uh, went to the British after uh, independence and the uh, other state. And subsequently we also raised uh, an 11th Gorkhas. Uh, 
So, uh, not all, but uh, initially, most of the Gorkhas came from Nepal, and there's a treaty where they can serve mm -hmm. uh, in India. Um, uh, some are Indian domicile, which gradually increased. I mean, uh, earlier it was 20% Indian domicile and 80% Nepal domicile. Today, I think it is 40% Indian domicile, 60% Nepal domicile. But today means recently, but today I think it's just different. With Agnivir coming in, uh, they, they're not having any recruitments from Nepal. But they're serving like any other uh, soldier. They're risking their life. Uh, you will find the number of awards they won, the number of operations they've participated in, a uh, number of wars that they've done fantastically well in, uh, just as uh, anybody else. And they are, they, they are really, uh, their martial skills are really, really good. I mean, they have, uh, they're very, very tough, especially in mountains, they are very tough, they're very focused, they are the least demanding troops. I mean, okay. uh, they just don't have any uh, concerns about that. And they have all those martial traits, they're fond of gambling and you know, all but uh, very interesting. Very interesting. Again, great troops. Great troops. And um, um, I read this thing that um, Field Marshal Sam Manikshaw said that if you meet a man and he says that he's not afraid of dying, he's, he's either lying or he's a Gurkha. Yeah, that's true. That's, I mean, it's true that uh, the, the Field Marshal did say this. Yes. And, and yes, I believe it is true. It is true. But that's fascinating. And how has your experience been working in um, Bollywood? I know that you helped with um, Sam Bahadur. How is that experience? Yeah, I, uh, I'd actually requested you to, uh, to bring this up because I also wanted to uh, place on record something, but I'll come to that later. Uh, we, we spoke uh, a bit about uh, retirement. So we, um, uh, we spoke about uh, retirement and when I retired, of course, I got a job and all. But I would never have imagined that my journey would sort of lead you to like Bollywood. So uh, before Bollywood, actually, I got uh, an opportunity to work uh, on a reality show uh, on Discovery. I did four episodes, uh, and again, by luck, I didn't apply for it. Just just happened that somebody contacted me. Uh, but Sam Bahadur was an an amazing experience. Uh, it just so happened that. Uh, uh, Field Marshal Manikshaw being from uh, Eight Gorkhas, uh, the producers approached uh, army headquarters and were then directed towards the colonel of the regiment. So through all channels it came to me, I volunteered, um, the director Meghna Gulzar uh, spoke to me and decided that I was suitable. Uh, but I, I was really very very touched by the way Bollywood perceives the defense forces. Um, it wasn't, I, I didn't think it would be like that. Uh, this is now, after Sam Badur, I've done another movie and uh, uh, also uh, hope that we'll be doing more. But in both these, I found that anybody that I've met on the set or outside the set in Bollywood, uh, the kind of regard they've given me to me symbolizes the regard they have for the armed forces. And I wanted to place this uh, on record. Uh, a director like uh, Meghna Gulzar is a celebrity in her own right. Uh, the actors that are celebrities. But uh, despite all these, you know, uh, sort of high profile people being there, I was always given the pride of place. and I. I really, really uh, appreciate that. I mean, to me, it shows the kind of respect that I found that people in Bollywood have for the defense forces. The experience itself was, of course, to me new. I mean, you see movies, you, I mean, I'm fond of Hindi yeah. movies, I see a lot of them, and you keep wondering, and you realize that what's happening behind the sets is actually 98% of what you actually see. Each and everything is very, very, uh, very engrossing, very interesting. Uh, they work like uh, like an infantry battalion. I mean, you have mm -hmm. the the director is the commanding officer, and uh, and sometimes the uh, the kind of uh, instructions that are uh, almost dictatorial. I mean, it's <laughs> it's not even that tough in the army. Okay. <laughs> what the director wants will happen. <laughs> Strict instructions. A great experience. 
No, that's also a very interesting journey that you've had. And um, this, this question's a bit like emotional and I want to ask you what does India or now we're calling Bharat mean to you personally? Like if it was just one word, what, what is India to you? Well, I, I, I won't put it in one word, but I do, do remember uh, the Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kua Yu, I think that was, uh, who was actually uh, I, I read somewhere that he mentioned that very early, I think somewhere in the 50s, that India couldn't sustain because, you know, it's not really a country, it's, it's just different people who are under one flag. So, uh, firstly, I'm proud that we proved him wrong. Yeah. Uh, I think we are the only country like this in the whole world. And the fact that we've not only remained united, uh, we've remained secular, and we have managed to remain a very, very vibrant and honest democracy. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that, I mean, all of us are, are, are so different. I mean, even people from North India, between you and me, we'll, we'll have so many, you know, in terms of uh, background differences. But we've managed to stay together as a country. And I think the first few decades were just sort of uh, stabilizing, so to say. And you see now that we've started actually growing to be much more dominant and successful. So uh, the idea of India that uh, many people would have perceived when India got independence of, you know, how will this country survive? I mean, look at them. They're poor. Uh, they're not educated. And it's not even a country. There are different kind of people here. And I mean, how will they, how will they bond? It is, I think, a great achievement that we have proved everybody wrong on that. We've managed to stay uh, a very, very successful country, very united, despite all those things that uh, we sort of had as baggage. Uh, I really feel proud about that. Yeah, and I think it's also like, um, even when I was like studying abroad, well, I would look at the news and it was just this sense of pride that we get to see like all those, you know, kind of um, sacrifices made by people like who came before us to achieve the India that we have now and to, you know, be present at this time where we can actually see the result of all those like hard work. I think it's like a great privilege and, a, you know, like a moment of great pride, I think, for all Indians who are in India or even abroad. It's, it's a great privilege. And um, reflecting on um, your military career and, you know, the kind of discipline you need over there, what are some key habits that have been, you know, very important for your success, resilience? Would a peg of rum in the evening count? Sure, whatever works for you. <laughs> to me, that's the most important <laughs> habit, but uh, no, seriously. Uh, yeah, you do uh, because you are you are uh, throughout your life in such a regimented schedule. You are, you know, getting up on time, and and those things carry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, even today, even though I'd like to laze around a bit, but uh, it gets beyond uh, even seven seven thirty. I start feeling that you know, aaj jada ho gaya. Uh, and most of us, uh, even if uh, we start getting older, we like to remain fit. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, this community of, uh, community in uniform, both retired and serving, that sort of remains uh, the anchor throughout your life. So my battalion, for instance, or, or my course mates, uh, who are like, say, when I'm working, when I was working for the movies, uh, I, w I would just call uh, some, some course mate and say, tell me this, how does it happen? So that bond and that anchor always remains. And uh, of course, you, you, you've been brought up with uh, that much discipline. Some of it will wear off, of course, after retirement because there is nobody to enforce it. But most of it has become so much part of your uh, habit, your uh, life, that it will remain. Right. And what would be your advice to individuals, civilians, who want to cultivate like a resilient mindset? Join the army. Join the army. <laughs> My next question was, um, what is something, what advice would you give to someone who actually wants to like join the defense forces? I, I don't think you'll get a better, uh, better career. Uh, it, it's, 
you don't join the army for money. Although now uh, I think the pays are pretty good also. I mean, they weren't uh, when I joined, but you had enough to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not lavish, but you could uh, you could lead a decent lifestyle, and of course associated with everything that you could do uh, within the army. Uh, but the kind of experience that the army will give you, uh, I don't think any other job in the world would. The kind of challenges, the the kind of satisfaction, the kind of ups and downs, it's it's a real roller coaster. And if you want an interesting life, if you want a fascinating life, if you want hutke, uh, then uh, you can shed your ties and suits, don a uniform, and you will find when you look back after. Uh, 30, 40, 50 years. I keep telling my kids, you know, that uh, life is a sum total of all your experiences. So, mm -hmm. many experiences gather kar sakte, you must try and gather as much that you can. You, know. you must look back when you are older and say, Mane ye bhi kiya hai, I've done this, I've, you know, just look back and. So, that kind of exposure, I don't think any other organization will give you. Mm -hmm. To be yes. able to look back and say, okay, I've done this. Uh, what this, I've done this also, and I've done more than that. Thank you, Karan Manish Singh, for coming onto my podcast. It has been an incredible experience just learning about, you know, the very like soldiers who go out there and are working day and night to make sure that civilians are safe and they can, you know, just live about their life peacefully, safely. And that is a lot of respect and gratitude for you and all the people in the Defense Forces. Your journey has been nothing less than a Bollywood movie itself. And I hope you continue to do things that bring you joy. And um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me.